Hi, I'm Ed Sparrowing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Mentor with David Fritz, going to talk today about inferencing at the edge. David, there's obviously too much data being produced by all these cameras, by radar, by LIDAR. Now we have to do some of this inferencing at the edge because it, otherwise in a car you're going to be sending through basically streaming data. It's just way too much data to process and move and it's going to slow things down. What are some of the challenges that you have to deal with there? Well, one of the interesting things that's changed in this regard recently is how neural networks are actually described and how they're built. So we have this concept of uh, YOLO, you may have heard of it, and it stands for you only look once. So we process an image, for example, only one time. And what that's done is that's allowed us to have an efficient way to actually take the knowledge that's been learned through machine learning and apply it to making decisions about uh, whether an object is there and if there is an object there, exactly what is that object. And that allowed us to move from, say, a GPU implementation, which could be very large and, and power hungry, to something is very small and efficient. And as soon as we make that transition, now all of a sudden we have the opportunity to move that kind of logic out to the edge, meaning much closer to the sensors. Some of the initial designs of of cars, at least conceptually, was that you would have a central uh, AI system, and that's probably still going to be there, but all the processing would be done there, and, and everything would send its data there. Even that's too slow, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that requires gigabytes, sometimes even terabytes of information over a short period of time, and it needs to be processed. So the idea is if you move that closer to the edge, then the training of the neural networks can be tailored directly to the type of data that's actually being perceived. For example, you would want to train a network to, to process raw data from a camera differently than from LIDAR or even radar. And then you could take the results of that processing at a more abstract level and simply ship that to a central decision-making CPU. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. What are we looking at here? So this is a representation at a very high level of how many consolidated ADAS and autonomous vehicles process this information. So here on the top we have cameras and there could be as many as 16 cameras you know, around the vehicle itself. And they're sending high resolution raw images at uh, you know, 60 frames per second or even higher. So there's incredible amounts of data happening there in real time. Plus we have LiDAR information coming in, radar information coming in, and then we have some sensor fusion logic that tries to make some sense of that and generate a 3D representation of what it believes is around the vehicle and sends that information to a decision-making processor. It's usually just a large SOC. Um, and then that processor then just makes the decisions. Am I going to steer? Am I going to brake? Am I going to speed up? Whatever. But what we're talking about computing on the edge, we're changing this paradigm quite a bit. So let me redraw this. So imagine for a minute that on each one of these sensors, we have the ability to build, let me redraw this a bit better, using the technology I mentioned earlier for inferencing. We have some relatively small printed circuit boards, and on there we have a little chip that's designed specifically to do high speed, very low power inferencing, in this case of raw camera images. So we have raw data coming in, and we have something else coming out. And what you have going out is a lot less data, but you've also taken what is basically a massive system of trying to run data through everything and said, we, these things don't have to be on all the time, right? They don't have to be functioning the same way they did as if everything was being shipped through to one place. Sure, not necessarily. Yeah, for example, um, if you're moving forward, the rear cameras don't necessarily have to be on. Or you could, instead of two, have just one. There are all kinds of things that you could do to conserve power. As we're moving closer and closer to electrification, you know, pure electronic vehicles, then that power consumption difference could be very significant because it reduces your range. And what you've also done is instead of, uh, you, you've really consolidated the data that you need to be able to do, right? And so now you don't have to push all this room. And what, 80, 90% of this is absolutely useless, but that 10% you have to have. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So what we can do here is the raw camera images. And, and the same thing with LiDAR and radar, but those are different cases 
It's easier to understand an image because we work with that every day. We're very visual beings. So if we take that raw image and we push it in here, there's several things that could come out. You could actually do the object detection and classification right here. So one potential output is this, or just the objects and the x, y, z coordinates of the centroid of that object. You could even possibly give it uh, a vector of the direction that it's moving. And if that were to go into your decision-making processor, okay, then the amount of processing that this is going to require is dramatically lower. And it could have its own neural networks in here that now operate at the object level rather than at the raw data level. And by raising that level of abstraction, you've probably also increased the reliability of the parts that are in there too, right? Because there's less stress on them. Yeah, you can actually even put redundancy down at the sensor level. Not necessarily duplicating every sensor, but say, as I said before, you could have as many as 16 of these cameras. So if you have two stereo cameras on the front, and one of them is obscured by mud, and the other one is not, then you can actually adjust for the fact that that's the case. So this is something of a leap of faith. How do we actually verify that this is going to work? So what we have the ability to do today is to model each one of these sensors at the edge. We can model the artificial intelligence in these small SOCs here close to the edge. And we can actually model the decision-making process as well. When you connect that to our ability to model actuation like brakes, steering, transmission, engine, etc. Then you now have the ability to say these would actually change what's being perceived. Once you have the ability to do that, you essentially have everything that you need to drive this virtual vehicle in this virtual world and show that these algorithms work, show that the decisions that are being made here work well. And you have the ability then in a deterministic and a repeatable way to control those scenarios so that we can start testing some of these core cases. Is there a way of testing the components in here as well to say these are now working properly, we've got the right data? Sure. So, I mean, you can use con conventional verification methodologies for each one of these. But we're talking about abstracting that to a level higher and say, do they work well together? Is the, is the vehicle as a system making the correct decisions? And we're doing that in this virtual way whereby the fidelity or the accuracy of the whole model is very high. That allows us to have confidence that if we test a corner case scenario, for example, um, seeing a kangaroo for the first time, which is famously in the, in the press recently, do we recognize that as a kangaroo? That might mean a lot if you're in Australia, not so much in San Francisco. But it also allows us to say, what does the vehicle see and what decisions does it actually make if you're driving over a bridge in San Francisco during an earthquake? That might not mean a lot to you in Sydney, Australia, but in San Francisco, it can be very important. Those are corner cases where it's extremely difficult to drive enough miles to test those. Whereas in this virtual high fidelity environment where processing is actually happening on the edge, we can then test those virtual scenarios and get some confidence by correlating decisions made here with actually those that are made in the physical platform or the physical vehicle once it exists. You're also adding in sort of a standardized way of looking at this. One of the problems in, in uh, automotive design is that every car maker, because it's so competitive, has been doing their own thing. And none of this, it, it, from one car maker to the next, is completely different. What you're talking about here is building some of the fundamentals in on a fairly st uh, standardized way, right? Yes. So a lot of what we're seeing is because of this, I don't want to call it the race to autonomy, but essentially people trying to to leap the chasm prematurely, a little bit too quickly. Um, the rigor and the methodologies that are being used um, can sometimes be brought into question. I'm not saying they're not validating their SOCs in the correct way, but they're not having the ability to show that before we put this vehicle on the road that it's going to behave properly in all these complex scenarios. 
What we're doing is we're trying to use an engineering-based, mathematical, formal methodology of solving this incredibly complex problem. By doing it this way, you also start getting away from that idea that only the, the high-end vehicles have this, this, these kinds of features in them, right? Right. I mean, one of the original assumptions made by the media and the whole industry was, well, we're going to need LiDAR, for example. LiDAR is extremely expensive. Therefore, people aren't going to be able to own their own autonomous vehicle. Therefore, there has to be ride-sharing and this just cascade of assumptions that are being made. But when you actually take a step back and you look at it, if you take an engineering approach to this and you move a lot more of the computation toward the edge, so the amount of information that's being processed is different, now all of a sudden we have the ability to say, actually this can be economical. This could be in low-end vehicles. Everybody can own one of these and put it in their garage if they so choose. And so cars on the road will actually behave in a fairly consistent manner as opposed to the only the expensive cars behave in one way and the, the cheaper cars behave in another, right? Yeah, that, absolutely, because they have the same kind of sensing and making similar decisions in the same scenario. And then you add on to the top of this a whole other discussion about vehicle to X, vehicle to infrastructure, communication, which is just honestly one more feed into the decision making process. Then now you can all behave almost in a swarm mentality, everybody operating under the same rules. Um, Do you need less cabling, less weight, because you're doing a lot of the processing closer to the edge as well? Yeah, actually, interestingly enough, we took a, uh, a look at a, a large U.S. OEM, automotive OEM, and we said if we did this sort of thing and if we sort of reorganized how the ECUs in this system were made based on this kind of technology and instead of say a CAN protocol this actually becomes Ethernet, we did that sort of thing, um, the estimate is we can actually save them about three thousand dollars per vehicle. So their cost of the vehicle goes down and it offsets the cost of all the extra sensing and processing. It also reduces the weight and manufacturing time that adds range. Lots of positive benefits just by taking sort of the next generation engineering view on how to solve the problem. David Fritz, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Oh, it's my pleasure, Ed. Thank you.